Yes, HBO in <laughs> sudden sensory neural hearing loss. This is a new kid on the block and actually quite an exciting one. So if you're not already aware of the potential to use HBO, I think it would be well worth at least getting a sense of what's involved here. I'm going to cover these areas and I'm going to go through them quickly. By way of background, the idea of using HBO in a sudden hearing loss is not a new one. But what is amazing is that following Louisiana State University and the uh, Underseen Hyperbaric Medical Fellowship's proposal to the UHMS, bearing in mind that the UHMS for pretty much 20 years had not added a single additional indication uh, other than uh, the retinal artery occlusion, uh, accepted this. And uh, in October 11, it was ratified, and now it is one of the internationally recognized indications. So that's quite exciting. You don't need to memorize this, but what you're looking at is Harrison's differential diagnosis related to sudden hearing loss, and you really have two pivot points. The one is, does the ear look abnormal? And the second thing is, how does the ear respond to um, audiological assessment. In other words, does impedance audiometry that considers the resistance in sound being transferred from the outside to the in-ear, is that abnormal or not? And here you get the structural problems, in other words, where the eardrum is abnormal, and below you have the mechanical problems. And sensory neural hearing loss falls into the nervous category. It's usually asymmetrical, and you could probably add uh, inner ear barotrauma into that category to some extent as well, because it manifests pretty much in the same way. But by definition, idiopathic is idiopathic. In other words, it fits in a way within that block, but we're not quite sure what causes it. It's an otological emergency though, 5 to 20 per 100,000 per year suffer from this condition. It's probably underestimated because they're spontaneous resolutions, which mean by the time they would have gone to the doctor, they're better. So you don't necessarily know. That's about the same rate as MS in our country, by the way, onset of MS. And uh, it was first described many, many years ago and basically means you've lost 30 decibels in at least three contiguous frequencies, so 250, 500, 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, you lost that over a period of three days and that constitutes sudden hearing loss. Now here's the rub when it comes to therapy. Firstly, between one and two thirds spontaneously recover. So you have to treat them quickly or they may recover spontaneously. Okay, But of course it also means that a third of them won't, and you don't know which ones they would be. There are various theories that range from vascular to immunological, and of course, for that reason, the management is filled with opinions and very little data. We know that the strength of opinion is inversely proportional to the amount of data. So they are very strong opinions. Most treatments involve more than one agent, shotgun sort of approaches, and there's enormous variability amongst the ENTs. If you compare what they do, uh, it's amazing how divergent the approaches are. So if you add all that together, you've got something that may improve on its own. Uh, it may be any number of days before the patient comes to you. You use variable protocols with different agents. How are you possibly going to determine what actually works? Very, very hard to do. Now here are some of the things on the menu. Basically, immunosuppression, and that could be oral or transtympanic. The interesting thing here is that they find that the mineral corticoids appear to be more effective than the pure glucocorticoids. In other words, those that have an aldosterone-like effect seem to be more effective. So the salones, the methylprednisolones. And if you remember, the ear and the kidney have a lot in common. And of course, between endo and perilymph, there's a tremendous sodium-potassium flux. And it may be that the aldosterone-type forms of steroid actually restore the balance in sodium and potassium between endo and perilymph as part of the therapeutic process. So just be aware of that. Watch the literature. It's the area that seems to be evolving. Then, of course, you have the vascular strategy. So you try and open everything up. Uh, from chemicals to even carbon dioxide inhalation and carbon dioxide uh, and hyperbaric oxygen of course to add oxygen and because you get a, a rebound vasodilation after treatment. 
vitamins to try and get the metabolism going, diuretics to try and uh, deal with the potential um, pressure in the endolymph that may ensue, antibiotics, although it's very controversial whether even antivirals have an effect, magnesium because it's neuron sparing, it just gets everything shut down um, so that uh, to some extent you may extend uh, the life of some of the neurosensitive cells and uh, all the way through to even using snake poison and throm thrombolytics and fibrinolytics and everybody swears with it and of course we don't quite know what works. Anticoagulation, um, sy sympathectomies by injection, the stellate ganglion blocks, etc, etc. A lot of things on the menu. What does HBO have to offer? Well, more oxygen. It uh, induces an antioxidant effect by inducing superoxide dismutase, makes red cells more flexible, and uh, produces that rebound vasodilation. We don't usually treat sufficiently to produce new vascularization, uh, but it's probably in there. The bottom line is we're working with this area. We're trying to improve oxygen delivery through the stria vascularis into endolymph. And the objective is to protect the sensitive cells, uh, sort of a hearing for dummies, the inner hair cells are the microphones, the outer hair cells are the amplifier. Okay? Now you can lose the amplifier to some extent, the brain ties, tries to compensate and that's where you get the hiss of tinnitus to a large extent, but if you've lost the microphones, you've lost that frequency. And I'll show you on an audiogram how you know the difference between the two. So that you want to keep these guys going as long as possible. And on the other side, you obviously want to add oxygen to keep those cells going, making the best use of the stria vascularis. Now we're fortunate that there actually have been two Cochrane reviews, an initial review and a subsequent revision that have looked from a meta-analysis point of view at what hyperbaric has to offer. And as I think you are probably familiar, if you've read Cochrane reviews, they seem damning when they're actually quite positive, okay? Because they are extremely critical of everything. But if you consider the other therapies that are involved, HBO actually outshines them to an enormous degree. So don't let that discourage you. I'm just going to run through this briefly so you know where the evidence is, and then I'm going to lead you through our experience and some take-home messages. Basically, Mike Bennett, who drove this uh, review, um, used a variety of sources to try and find either randomized or pseudo-randomized controlled trials, and then looked at what the effect was at either uh, the sudden hearing loss group or tinnitus. So those were the two groups they looked at. The studies that they considered were between 85 and 2004, involved some 400 patients, of which 207 received HBO. There were only seven trials, and I'll show you the contrast between them in a moment. The entry was very, very variable, though, because they would accept essentially any adult with sudden hearing loss of unknown origin, and some accepted them very early, like Fattori was two days, Hoffman and the others were about two weeks, so you had a sense of whether it was likely to recover spontaneously or not. Hoffman, in another study, went as far as six months, and uh, a Pilgrim did essentially two, also two weeks. And uh, two weeks is probably the time that you want to be thinking of HBO. It's better if it's sooner, but I think by two weeks, if there isn't a recovery, you probably uh, have a very strong case to consider HBO. Hoffman, in one of his studies, actually used the two weeks, but not only two weeks, the failure to respond to conservative measures. And that's possibly a practical posture while we're trying to uh, lobby for this indication with ENTs. So if you speak to ENTs, I would suggest, well, you know, if you're not ready to, to send the patient now, bearing in mind medical aids don't pay for this yet, they haven't got on board, well, you know, if nothing's working by two weeks, the literature really supports trying hyperbaric oxygen. Okay, the lowest dose was 1.5 for 40 min 45 minutes for 15 days, and the highest dose, 2.5, 90 minutes for 25 uh, days, or 25 treatments. And the other authors were somewhere in between. What were the outcomes? Well, they looked at, was there a change in acute hearing loss or chronic hearing loss? To keep it simple, I'm just going to look at the high points. They looked at some other qualitative measures, um, 
a quality of life, uh, obviously adverse events related to HBO. There wasn't too much there. I'll give you a couple of data bits on that, uh, but the secondary measures didn't really feature uh, in this analysis. So, the first and the highest bar they tried to raise was whether or not there would be a 50% return in hearing by the end of therapy. So they asked the question, would HBO produce that? And the answer in short is no. There was no significant chance of reducing the level of deafness by 50%. So they couldn't achieve that. The next was to see, well, can we restore 25%? And that did, or that did actually achieve statistical significance. So the proportion of patients or participants that had greater than a 25% return of hearing. And that is actually quite remarkable in a condition where at that stage it was unlikely for these people to recover. So, put differently, there's a 22% greater chance of improving if you add HBO, or the number needed to treat for an extra good outcome is 5 and that's not bad. That's really not bad considering the other therapies and the devastation of significant hearing loss. The mean improvement of pure tone audiometry is probably at this stage the best benchmark. Jacek, your study also looked at that. I'll show you um, graphs uh, towards the end. So the mean improvement in pure tone audiometry has been a useful measure. And there there was a mean improvement of 61% when HBO was applied compared to 24% in the control. So now we're getting somewhere. Trying to quantify it in decibels, looking at an absolute improvement greater than 20 decibels did not achieve statistical significance. But again, looking at the mean improvement in hearing over all frequencies, HBO did achieve statistical significance. So 15.6 uh, decibel greater mean improvement over frequencies. And that's significant. Now, Mike Bennett um, is a realist and a skeptic. I'm sure you'd get on very well with him. Um, and he said, well, you know, many of these people started deaf and they were still deaf. But I'll submit to you there's a difference between severe hearing loss and moderate hearing loss. And if the objective is even to reduce people to moderate hearing loss, that is a significant improvement in quality of life. And I'll show you why in a moment. Okay, so there is a statistical improvement in the group between moderate and severe hearing loss. And here's something that may be useful for you conceptually. Your amplifiers, the outer hair cells, essentially add about 65 decibel uh, am amplification. In other words, if you lose an outer hair cell, you basically lose hearing thresholds to about 65. Okay, If you have a greater loss than that, you're starting to lose inner hair cells. It's an oversimplification, I readily admit, but it gives you a sense of what's getting damaged. So down to 65 means you've lost the amplifier. Beyond 65, you've lost more than the amplifier. You're now also losing the microphones. Why is that important? Well, hearing instruments can make up for the amplifier. They can't make up for the microphone. So if you can get people back into the range where amplification would restore hearing, you've done a very, very good thing. This is a graph. I'll send you the uh, presentation so you don't need to squint. The bottom line is that in moderate and severe hearing loss, there was a statistically significant improvement when HBO was added in the therapeutic regimen. So we probably would not be treating people with hearing loss um, that is better than 40 decibels. We would probably want to go between the 40 and 90 decibel thresholds. Whether it works in profound hearing loss, good question. Basically, profound hearing loss is a dead ear. But I've learned in medicine, never say never. And I'll show you just now why it's sometimes so humbling. I'll summarize the chronic uh, hearing loss information by basically saying there was no real statistical significance using HBO at that stage. So beyond six months to a year, there is very limited uh, benefit in uh, adding HBO, either from a tinnitus point of view or from an audiology uh, point of view. 
Now, from an adverse effect, obviously some patients can get middle ear barrow trauma, and Pilgrim did report on that, but there were no systematic reviews of the adverse uh, side effects. So, what does Cochrane summarize? They say, well, it's seven trials, 400 people, meta-analysis couldn't include all of those, methodological quality varied, the trials varied, the entry criteria varied, the outcomes varied, and the outcomes weren't consistently reported. But I can tell you, comparing what this showed um, relative to other measures that have been used with idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss, it's actually not too bad. We can definitely do better, but it's not too bad. Clearly, because you have a small trial, you're entering people at variable uh, times, uh, there would be a bias related to that. Obviously, there is a high rate of spontaneous recovery, but if you look at the number of people that were enrolled beyond two weeks, I think that we can safely say that HBO uh, does have something to offer, but we cannot use generalizations. We cannot just look at this simply and say that it'll work for everybody. Now, where does that leave us? Well, officially, it says we've got limited evidence, and we cannot routinely recommend HBO for sudden sensory neural hearing loss. But I think we actually can go beyond that. Let me just share some of our experiences. My first experience with inner hear hearing loss issues really started with this gentleman doing a dive in Bushman's Hut to 252 meters, coming to the dive show, the dance show that I was staffing at that stage, and this little boy tapping me on the shoulder and pointing, and his dad was standing there with complete cloth ears. So Nuno had done this dive, and he had essentially on the way to the surface lost his hearing, and you can see the audiograms, basically that's 70 decibels. So this is between profound um, and severe hearing loss. I didn't think he had a chance. It was already 24 hours since he'd lost his hearing because he'd driven all the way from Kuruman. And Joe Farmer from Duke University said, basically, you've got 68 minutes. If you have inner ear hearing uh, or inner ear decompression sickness, you've got 68 minutes. Otherwise, they don't improve. Now, clearly, after five recompressions and one month later audio, he's basically back to minimal hearing loss which was quite amazing. I didn't see his, his uh, pre-morbid uh, audiogram, so I don't know how that compared, but that is fully functional hearing. So that impressed me, but what confused me is the literature on inner ear decompression sickness, especially in these sort of deep dives, suggested that the mechanism of injury was an explosion of osteoclasts entrapped in bone. And you get this explosion, complete destruction, ultimately uh, obliteration and fibrosis of the inner ear, shown in monkeys, but even some um, post-mortem human specimens have confirmed that this mechanism is true, but in saturation diving, that is not what we find in decompression illness of the typical trimix diver. So, with that experience under the belt, I certainly was a little bit more open-minded about this indication. And at uh, the Stellenbosch unit, we've had eight patients so far. One declined uh, because the medical aid didn't pay. It seems that uh, later it was actually a many years problem and not uh, uh, the classic sudden hearing loss. But seven received HBO, and we really undertreated them. Uh, between four, the lowest, and ten, the highest number of treatments. And the reason for that is because medical aids didn't pay. But five had significant improvements, and I'm going to show you two of their audiograms that really represent uh, the, the typical response we've had. Uh, initially, one person had, was, was unchanged, and we didn't quite know what to make of it. Then she had a spell of vertigo and was diagnosed as menia and promptly improved. So I think that we need to be a bit more sensitive about menia's disease in relation to this cluster of sudden hearing loss, and I'll show you how I think we can help do the differential diagnosis. One recently with profound hearing loss with two, uh, uh, two months delay came, and we have not seen any change with him. He's going to go for a three-month follow-up, but I doubt we'll see a change. But we had a postgraduate uh, student from UCT uh, come three weeks ago, uh, uh, literally one day after onset of sensory neural healing loss, and I thought this guy was going to be the candidate. And we put him in the chamber, and basically after five treatments that he was paying for on his own as a student, nothing. So I was rather disappointed, 
um, as is typical, he indicated that sensation was returning around the ear and that we have found almost consistently and is usually a good harbinger of recovery. They'll tell you after the second treatment or so, they can suddenly feel the ear and it's as if this vacuum that was um, beside the ear and almost felt as if they were walking into walls, that's gone. And that's usually been a good sign. He was reporting that, but nothing else. And I called him literally in preparation for this talk. Uh, and as I said, it's about three weeks ago. And after speaking to him, I got a call from him the next day. And he said, you know what, after you'd spoken to me that night, I had a sort of a funny tingling in my ear, and I can suddenly start hearing on the cell phone now, and you know, I hear music, and I hear my girlfriend speaking to me, so I don't know what's going on, but it's certainly better. Now, I'm not suggesting my phone call helped, although, you know, anything can happen. But I'm very grateful that I literally changed the slide because I, I had two people that didn't improve and uh, he's actually been, been added. So it's only one person in our little series that hasn't improved and he was quite a delayed and a profound case. With medical aids not paying, it's a bit of a problem. And as I say, there are these many cases that we actually need to start thinking about. And that brings me to a test that I don't know whether you're even aware of. How many of you know about vestibular evoked myogenic potentials? Hands. Does anybody really know about that? Okay, maybe you've heard about it because I've told you. Well, I didn't know about it until Neil Shepard educated me, so I don't blame you at all. But basically, I'm sure you've seen the karate movies where they slap the guy in both ears and they go down like a stone. Well, it's probably an over-exaggeration, but acute pressure stimulation of the sacculus does um, cause relaxation of anti-gravity muscles. So it's actually a physiological response. And it doesn't need to be heard, it's a pressure effect on the sacculus. Because you see what happens is as the stapes is depressed, if you have this pressure going into the inner ear, direct stimulation of the sacculus causes a relaxation of all the anti-gravity muscles. That's a physiological effect. Why is it useful? Well, it's useful in the context of vestibular neuritis because you've got a superior and an inferior vestibular nerve. The superior one supplies the anterior and horizontal semicircular canal and that gives you the classic vertigo that the people complain about. But you've also got an inferior vestibular nerve that supplies the posterior and, of course, the utricle and sacculus. Why is that relevant? Because what happens is people get vestibular neuritis, seem to sort of recover, and then six months later they have benign positional nystagmus in the same ear that was dead. And people wonder why on earth could that be true because it had vestibular neuritis. The reason is they lost two of the components of that inner ear, but the posterior canal, the inferior vestibular nerve, is actually still working. And because there was damage to, to the otoliths and so on, it falls into the one sensing semicircular canal on that side. So where does a VEMP fit in? A VEMP can tell you whether you've lost the entire inner ear or whether you've only lost those components supplied by the superior vestibular nerve. So a VEMP is useful to differentiate partial versus complete unilateral vestibular loss. But it has another function. The other function is, because the sacculus is pressure sensitive, if someone has Meniere's disease and you've got endolymph hydrops, it is already partially pressurized, which means it's more pressure sensitive. So these people have an elevated VEMP. A VEMP is therefore a way to essentially have a better differential diagnosis for Meniere's. And that's not a common known fact. And maybe that's helpful to you. And I think as we stratify these patients with idiopathic hearing loss, VEMPs may actually be a useful consideration. Okay, so two patients just quickly to give you a sense of where we are. This lady came to us three days after developing uh, hearing loss. And you can see that she definitely has uh, moderate uh, to severe uh, hearing loss in the left ear. And that's basically what we had one month afterwards. So. Quick response, could she have been a spontaneous recovery? Maybe, but the response in direct relation to the hyperbaric treatments, blow by blow, everyday reporting improvement, suggests to me that there was an absolute, or there was a definite therapeutic aspect to what we were doing. 
Would she have recovered completely on her own? I can't say. Were we doing something useful? I believe so. This lady, eight days after uh, hearing loss, and again, you can actually see this person is bordering on profound. And yet, same deal, day 10, um, seven treatments with six month follow up, you can actually see the recovery. So we eventually got her to get the audiogram for the sake of the presentation and our data. So that's why it was a six month follow up. Some of them, they're better, they just don't want to go back to the audiologist. So again, these are the sort of patterns, but they won't all go back into the minimum thresholds. But even if you can get a severe candidate to moderate hearing loss, you've made a significant difference. If you are severe hearing impaired, you have to lip read. Okay, with a hearing instrument it can certainly help, but you lip read. If it's moderate, you don't need to. And you basically then need the, hear lead the hearing instrument to understand the articulations of speech. It makes an enormous quality of life difference. And this is Jacek's uh, article. Uh, it wasn't included in the Cochrane Review, but they had a very, uh, a, a very involved ENT department, and up to 97 they had a standard protocol involving vascular um, interventions mostly and, and uh, cortisone. And then after 97, you maybe need to tell the story just now, uh, Jacek, they started including HBO. And they were so impressed with the results and the improvements, this is the improvement in the mean um, uh, hearing thresholds for pewterne audiometry that they have reached the stage where they consider it unethical to do a controlled study. And we're back to the gas gangrene dilemma, aren't we? In other words, we can no longer prove that it works because it's unethical to do the study. And I think that something we'll probably have to tell our medical aides is if an academic institution is considering it unethical to withhold the treatment in a cohort, clearly that also represents a level of evidence. Otherwise you're trapped in limbo because you'll no longer be able to do the study and yet you don't have the evidence to convince people that purely look from that evidence paradigm. So I don't know, Jacek, I don't know whether you could maybe weigh in on that and maybe give us a bit of the history of what happened. It's absolutely correct that one day laryngologists read about the hyperbaric oxygenation and they started to send us the patients, it was many years ago. And after a few months, after several patients, they saw the real improvement in most of patients. I'm not quite sure, maybe this was a spontaneous recovery, it doesn't matter, but they would have had it before. They started to send us patients. So after that, we monitor those patients using the historical case control. Obviously, this cannot be included in the Cochrane study. But after three years, they, they uh, clearly showed that the uh, corticosteroids plus the hyperbaric oxygenation gives the best results. And for them, after the analysis yes. of more than 30 years of trying of treatment of the sudden deafness, they found that this is really the best, uh, the best result. They are not perfect. We are, uh, let's say, I'm saying that we can, we can help not more than 70% of patients. We have, we observe this spontaneous recovery. I do believe, I, do, I cannot prove it, but I, I can say you that if after three or five hyperbaric sessions, patients record the significant improvement in hearing, we are treating this as a spontaneous recovery and we are stopped treating inside the hyperbaric chamber. So we are starting as soon as possible. However, we are also stopped as soon as possible if the improvement is very fast. If the improvement is not very fast, we are doing 15 sessions, and after 15 sessions, we are doing the audiometry. If there is a significant improvement, we are prolonging this up to 20 or 25 sessions. So we must simply show to our insurer that we are improving the status of the patients. And that's why we do believe that, uh, that the first delay is important, and secondly, even the 50% uh, of spontaneous recovery is not so bad to start early because the uh, significant, for every patient, it is very significant to start as soon as possible. And I would like also to criticize a little bit of Cochrane because those results are quite interesting for us. And this is scientific. However, there are a lot of reports from Japan and from Chinese <coughs> just showing that the sooner you start, mm -hmm the better results are. They are not included in the program, mm -hmm. but we cannot neglect 
the medical history and our own history to those patients. That's why, if possible, we should do this. Right now, at the moment, we unfortunately, let's say that way, we cross the momentum that we are unable to do this study anymore. Because first, laryngologists refuse to uh, not to send patients inside the hyperbaric chamber, and we are paid from the insurer for doing the, the hyperbaric oxygenation. And in fact, that's why we are not not considering uh, medical studies uh, uh, anymore. And, and far as I remember, also in the cost projects, there were uh, some trials to uh, to start the multi-center international prospective uh, study concerning the. the uh, hyperbaric oxygenation in being closed. However, most centers were unable to fulfill those strict criteria and most centers are still treating patients outside the study. And the another important point, I do believe it is, it is important, uh, it is, uh, uh, could be interesting for you to know, that in our patients, the sudden deafness after, let's say, many years after studies, uh, after several presentation in, the, in our country, the sudden deafness is the, third, the main indication, the most popular indication, even before the problematic ones. Sure. So right now, this is for us the main indication for treatment sure. in our region. There are a lot of such patients. So if you try to convince of, for uh, considering the hyperbaric oxygenation, you will see the increase of patients who will be referred to your department and you will see the positive results. However, I have a conflict of interest because I'm living from the hyperbaric oxygenation. That's why I'm asking for patients to the hyperbaric genes. Uh, Thank you, Jacek. So, so to summarize, we're really looking at idiopathic sudden sensory neuro hearing loss, particularly in the moderate and severe categories. The extent to which it would help profound uh, hearing loss is an area that I certainly would want addressed. Ideally, it should be treated within 14 days. Um, the literature becomes rather scanty in terms of anticipated improvements beyond three months. So one wants to get going before then, the sooner the better. The treatment range typically would be between five and uh, 15 treatments. We treat uh, typically five times simply because the of the funding uh, um, structure, if you will, at two ATA. And our routine is to do an audiogram after five treatments. If there's no improvement after five treatments, then we leave the decision up to the patient to say, well, we cannot say whether HBO is going to add a greater value. What we found, though, is that after five treatments, very much along the lines that you've said, they have improved sufficiently that they are content to discontinue HBO at that stage. And we found that the audiograms taken then uh, continue to improve to, to after a month. So it seems that we've reversed the process. And I think that's probably what we're doing in, in those early, uh, early patients. So the goal. At, at, the, at the least, I would say, is to try and move severe hearing loss to moderate hearing loss that is a far better uh, quality of life. And VEMPS may be a helpful addition in delineating the possible cases of many years disease within this group. And with that, I'm all ears, so if there are any questions, fire away. Uh, just to repeat the question was, would a hood uh, maybe have a, an additional effect? That's an intriguing one. Uh, of course, then one would um, either consider, you know, even grommets, you know, so that you'd have an even greater maintenance of high oxygen in the chamber under the premise that there is gas absorption through the round and even the oval window to some extent. Um, that is described. It would be experimental at this stage, so it wouldn't be something that I would uh, consider. But many of these patients actually get uh, transtympanic steroids, long-acting steroids, and they would be in that category. Whether they would do better, I can't say, uh, but it is an intriguing possibility at least to ponder. Thank you for that question. May I, may I comment on Please. that? Please. That there were some trials or direct insufflation of the oxygen inside the middle air through the eustachian tube. This is not proven treatment, but nevertheless, um, always when we consider uh, uh, incision for the membrane, we are always considering the good, just uh, looking for this effect yeah. as well. Interesting. Nice. Any other questions?
So in France you alluded to it a little bit, but uh, in terms of your own personal perspective of what the actual mm -hmm. physiological mechanism is, obviously we will switch off the uh, the phone at this stage. That, well, that's, uh, that's the million dollar question. I think that very much along the, the same lines as neurological injury, there's the concept of a penumbra. And I think that the threshold where cells discontinue operating and where they ultimately die are different levels. And I think that we're probably extending the period in which those cells remain viable. Another intriguing effect, but there will need to be significantly more studies done, is that there is a retinoblastoma protein gene that is known to switch on in mammals, um, more the sort of lower order like guinea pigs, and actually reproduces inner and outer hair cells. It is possible, although one, that's, it is possible that uh, we may actually have some genetic effects as well. But that needs to be tested, etc., etc. But we have the capacity genetically to reproduce in and out of hair cells. What we don't know is why we don't. So, other than that, edema, restoration of blood flow, and, and just getting things going again. Good, good, intriguing question. Anything else? A question, last question. Uh -oh. do, you, do you include a... Uh, 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 acoustic trauma inside the, your patients and indication for hyperbaric treatment? Uh, do we consider acoustic trauma as an indication for HBO? Well, there's literature supporting it. Uh, we haven't had many patients referred with it. Would I consider treating them? Yes. I would. Uh, I might, and I haven't, I haven't had a patient to, to work through this yet, but I might consider putting PE tubes in so that if there was either a fistula or some sort of partial rupture of the membranes in the ear, that the pressure excursions related to equalization wouldn't make it, for, uh, wouldn't make it worse. So that might be something I would consider in those patients. But I haven't, I haven't had experience. Have you? Yeah. Yes. Tell us about yours then. Yeah. Don't ask me the question. Answer it. <laughs> Because in the United States they accepted only the uh, sudden hearing loss, yes. and I'm not quite sure whether ah. they include also the acoustic trauma. In our department, we are treating acoustic trauma yeah. in, in a standard way, the same way as the sudden deafness. And I know exactly that in military area, like for example in Belgium, they started routinely to monitor mm. the uh, function of ears after the military service trainings. And they found a lot of sudden hearing loss sure. due to acoustic trauma. trauma. And right now they are doing the prospective study concerning treatment, but the results are very uh, encouraging. Promising. Yeah. Okay. Gregory? Do you think we've crossed the uh, threshold in our country as far as ethics is concerned? Can't we do a prospective randomized trial in our country? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. I think we probably still could because people aren't referring patients yet. Whether we would formally be able to exclude potential referrals and randomize them out, I think that would, would be tricky, but I think one probably could. It's, it would be an interesting ethics, I don't know, Tyson, would you weigh, weigh in on, on the ethics consideration, a Cochrane review, number needed to treat five, 25 percent chance adding, would an ethics committee look favorably upon deliberately excluding patients? Probably first have to repeat the systematic review, total, total meta-analysis, including the Japanese data and the Polish data. Just, just repeat so they can hear? I mean, it's again, there will be an update of the current systematic review and full meta-analysis, and then based on that information, make a decision on whether you could or not. It's, it's, it's all about clinical equipoise, so if you can say that the data...